Hi guys, I've figured out that I do these voice recordings at the worst possible time uh, so I'm exhausted and this is cutting a long story pretty short so it's about three days since I got the progressive jackpot display. These go on top of each of a bunch of networked gaming machines and they progressively calculate or increment a bunch of jackpots of varying degrees of probability of achieving uh, until they go off. In order to work with it, because it would be nice to have it do what I want, it's got a few more parts that I want to remove, at least for now, uh, than I actually need, including a hefty speaker and mono audio amplifier. If I did something with audio, I'd probably want to use this, but it's in the way for now. Uh, it's also got a, an ADC, or a DAC, sorry, a uh, digital to audio converter, some sort of codec chip on the right. Um, if I was going to do something, I'd use my own audio. Um, so I'll keep the amplifier and dispose of the audio board. It seems the audio board was two-channel, stereo capable, but the amplifier chip isn't. The DAC looks like some sort of codec decoder, but if I was going to do that, I'd stick with the VS1003B uh, that I've used before. So I'll toss the audio board and keep the amplifier. The controller board has ports for a serial modem and network interface. I won't be really wanting any of this, I'm getting rid of the whole controller board, but they were only sockets wired straight to the controller PCB. My own microcontroller board should replace this controller, but it looks interesting. It's got a processor that I'm not familiar with, but I recognise the Motorola logo, of course. Uh, it's got uh, 4 megabytes of RAM, if I'm not mistaken, and also plenty of flash space, and a real-time clock. I never saw anything of an interface other than the introduction screen and the plasma effect money. To begin with, I wanted to emulate the communication from the controller board, uh, and it makes its communication only as output through these tri-state buffers. They all have a not output, so there's a 17-bit interface all up, um, but there's actually 34 connections because there's a not for every output. The LED array PCB itself is an 80 by 48 pixel bicolor LED display. Uh, the red and green are used to produce orange and shades of yellow. Uh, it's got 60 of these LED controller chips, which are basically 16-bit shift registers. The timing for all of the common signals for these 60 chips are buffered and fanned out by this PGA. That's the common signals like the latch and the serial clock. This chip also modulates a bunch of FETs that disconnect the LED modules from their drivers. That's done instead of using the dedicated blanking function of the LED drivers. Interfacing directly to the rows of LED drivers was a backup plan that I did end up having to resort to. It would be physically more convenient to operate the board through the PGAs, but these drivers are well documented. So I'm going to start with a controller that I'm getting more and more familiar with, the DSPIC 33 fj 128 gp 802 To mimic the output of the original controller, I'm going to use a bunch of hex inverters. Two hex inverters for each channel can provide a not and a true output, with a bit of added propagation delay. For using inverters, I also gave up the tri-state output. I can't switch high impedance with these, but I noticed the original controller can't set the enable pins individually. I'm sure it looks nice with the red and green for the true and not outputs, but regardless, I couldn't talk to the thing through its original interface, so I've ditched the PGAs. Doing so disconnects the 50-way IDC connector and frees it up, so I can still use it physically and keep the board kind of neat by bridging wires across these pads. That way I can connect directly to the cascaded rows of LED drivers. The FETs that they use to modulate the LED rows directly, I've simply shorted out for now. Um, I don't think I'll need them because I'll be cycling rows at a time if I'm going to do video with this thing. So far as bridging across those PGA footprints, I've only done one of six rows of controllers for now. 
For this test I'm sending the same 16-bit word 10 times across the display and then rotating it. Uh, it looks a little different here than what it actually looks in real life, but what I see is the, the whole display moving left, uh, but also the number of columns steps down until it gets to 1 and then becomes solid again. For this test the latch pins are permanently active, allowing a new display every time you shift in one new bit, but that wouldn't be very good for a video display because we need to update frame at a time. For this test I'm incrementing a 16-bit value every time it's been shifted 10 times to all controllers in the row. The major difference is that I'm only latching once all controllers in the row have been updated. Much closer to how a graphics display for a game would work, except that I should be writing to one literal row at a time, which means that it would take 8 of those complete updates to write a row of controllers. Still a lot of work to do.